Hello, I'm Dave Porter. I am going to be joining the team here at the Bonneville shop shortly. Are we <laughs> on right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, good. So tell me about how you got started fixing up uh, vintage Brit bikes. Well, I owned a bicycle shop at the time, and um, I had this motorcycle inventory that I had bought from a dealer that uh, had retired. And uh, so the, the initial thought was to educate myself with the parts books and to start selling some parts as a way to augment my wintertime downturn in business in the bike shop. And so I started getting, interesting, getting interested in learning more about um, the mechanics that go into it. And, you know, one thing led to another, and I did about a half dozen of my own bikes and realized, hey, I can do this. I don't know if I can warranty this, but it's, it's my own bike. So um, after I got enough uh, inquiries about it and, and realized I'm turning a lot of business away, I started taking customer repairs on. And initially it was mainly Triumph 650s and 750s. And then a, a, the occasional 500 would come in. A guy with a BSA A65 would need something, and I realized, you know, the architecture is pretty much the same for all these British bikes from that the Halcyon days, the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so why not, you know, expand this a little bit? And so that's how I got into it, and you know, eventually, up, just up until recently, that's what I was doing. I, What's your favorite bike to ride then? <laughs> uh, my favorite is probably going to have to be a Triumph TR6R from 1970. Okay. Um, that bike right there. <laughs> we got one in the I've shop. I've restored, yeah. I've done two nice restorations. I've owned four of them. And I'm going to be bringing one home from Colorado to Iowa with awesome. me. So, yeah. Awesome. That, that's my favorite. And um, they're the, they're, they were really the pinnacle of that pre oil and frame construction you know the way that the they had the classic triumph lines they they really were uh, very highly developed you know at the, for being a 650 um, just great bikes easy to keep in tune they handle nice the the color scheme is polarizing on that bike not everybody likes that <laughs> but i've always been fond of it so yeah. that would have to be my favorite my first motorcycle was a bike i bought off of ebay in 2001 a 1971 Triumph Bonneville T120R. And a very common bike, they made a gazillion of them, and there's still a lot of them around. And it uh, didn't have an ignition, so I had to learn how to make a Boyer work on there, because it costs less to do a Boyer electronic ignition than it would be to source all the uh, original type parts. So after a lot of trial and error, I got the bike to run, had a whole lot of fun with it, and decided I needed to go on to the next challenge. So. I sold it on eBay, made a couple bucks on it, and the next bike was a another 71, but a TR6R that was a basket case. And it was owned by a painter, and the painter had done the tin work and painted it, but he hadn't done anything mechanically with it. So I got it back together, had a lot of fun with that. It took me three or four months, and then just started kind of moving on, and, and you know, until I, I, I don't have a count but I would say I've probably bought and, and fixed up and sold maybe 25 to 30 of them. And then I got into BSAs, <laughs> yeah. that was kind of secondary, and had a lot of fun with those. And uh, the BSAs don't seem to be as universally loved as the Triumphs, mm -hmm. but uh, learned that. And have, oddly, I've never owned a Norton Commando, but I have worked on a few of them, so I know my way around that. And those are really the big three marks in the, you know, the vintage British motorcycle world. So, you know, the, the BSA were, they, they sold a lot of them because they had that chrome tank. And mm -hmm. Everybody loved the chrome. A lot of people don't think that they were engineered as well. And they were priced just a little bit under what the Triumphs were for each like model. So there's a, they were a ton of, a lot of BSAs sold, and for whatever reason, it seems like they were more abused. They mm -hmm. weren't, you're more likely to find a completely roached out BSA twin than a Triumph. I mean, not to say there's not a lot of Triumphs out there in that condition, but the Triumphs and the Norton somehow got more love, right. I, I think. I had a BSA A65 Firebird that was a chopper, and somebody had, I, I got it real cheap, and it was a fairly rare model. I think it was a 69, 1969 model here. And uh, this was truly a Pandora's box of issues. 
And so I had to have the frame repaired because of the the rarity of this bike. Um, you know, it, it, it warranted being restored. And I didn't do a real nut and bolt restoration, but I brought it back to a mostly stock condition. And I had to have the frame uh, well re-welded, cut and re-welded because the, the steering head uh, had been raked out. And so, you know, and that's what made it into a chopper for the previous owner. That one, um, you know, I didn't make any money selling it. Uh, I put a lot into it and it was just, it was my second or third BSA twin. So it took a long time. I was learning a lot and, you know, there was a lot that went into it. Uh, those those engines require a little more attention on the bottom end when, you, when you're doing a full rebuild in terms of the alignment of the bushings and the bearings and that kind of thing. So um, it, it took a lot of machine work to yeah. really get it to where I was going to be satisfied with it. So it was up and running when you were done? It was up and running. I rode it for six months and found a buyer for it. Awesome. <laughs> that was kind of what I did in, in most cases. I would, I would try to put three or four hundred miles at least and own the bike for several months before I was comfortable, you know, putting it on the market to sell. Because I was a little generous with my time and uh, I, I hated the idea of a comeback. Mm -hmm. So I would check once, I would check twice, I would check three times on just about anything I did because I was very thorough. And some things, frankly, I just didn't have any experience with. So I had to lean on some of my resources, which was print stuff. I never really used YouTube or anything like that. But I was blessed. Uh, when I got into this business that I had a lot of really good mentors. Mm -hmm. I had three or four guys and sadly a couple of them aren't with us anymore, but they were guys that came up in the 50s and 60s and they knew the answer. They knew they could look at a part, they could tell if it was worn out or not. They could look at it and we could put a micrometer on it and say this is out of spec but not that far out of spec. What's the circumstance? Is this uh, are we, is, are, do we have an eye towards budget with this project or is it no expenses spared, replace everything? Mm -hmm. So I, I developed kind of a sense for when you know you can reuse a used part and when it has to be replaced. And I learned a lot of you know some of the engineering that went into it by way of, of having some of these guys to guide me. They would come by and visit me and hey, what are you working on today? <laughs> and, you better look at this here or you better check that out and so but I really enjoyed the uh, when we were up off of Highway 93 in Golden Pine Ridge Road which is uh, goes in back of the hog that beautiful road testing course and I really looked forward to doing shakedown rides on that road because it was so nice back there and then when we were down um, in Wheat Ridge we were kind of at the mouth of the canyon that runs up from 44th um, and Youngfield up to the Coors Brewery. And that was about five miles each way. It was a 10 mile shakedown ride. That was also another nice little ride. So, you know, doing the shorter rides on other people's motorcycles <laughs> was kind of fun, you know, back in, uh, back in that canyon and then up through Easley Road. So a lot of, a lot of people will recognize those names for that part back in Golden and West Arvada. So I used to do a lot of shorter rides, and, and if the bike broke when I was out or quit running, you know, it, it, it was a long pushback, but not that bad. I wasn't out 20 miles. Yeah, so, yeah. that's probably so, a good thing. That's yeah, really so sense. that's really, yeah, that's really been my, uh, the extent of most of my motorcycle riding yeah. is just doing that's test And I used to, um, you know, when time would allow it, I'd go to like the uh, British Conclave. That was always kind of fun because you'd see different bikes and rekindle friendships with people you only have seen once a year or once every other year. Yeah. I was a member of the BMAC, the British Motorcycle Association of Colorado, so I knew some of those guys and did some work on some of their bikes, sold some parts to them, and um, over the years have developed a fair amount of knowledge on the history, the different models, compatibilities, um, you know, sensible upgrades, electrical upgrades, for example, you know, a lot of that is, makes those old bikes work a lot better. Last couple of years, I've been in uh, a Harley Davidson dealership. Well, there's a completely different world. And uh, I'm really enthusiastic and excited to get back into what I uh, appreciate and know. Yeah. So that's, that's where I got to that point.